Hello, welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Alana here with Jamie. How are you, Jamie? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing? Good. It's fun to see you. It feels like it's been a little bit since we've recorded. So hello. Hello again. (laughs) I'm excited about today's topic. We're going to be talking about ADHD, specifically how it impacts adult women, which is totally different than what most of us have been conditioned to think about and how it impacts our prayer life. So I'm really excited. Do you want to jump in with an opening prayer for us? Yeah. God, we just thank you for being here with us today and just that your presence is is tangible, um, that we have access to you anytime we want to pray. We just thank you for um, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, God, no matter what we struggle with, no matter what our perceived limitations or things we like or don't like about ourselves, God, you have made us. And I just pray that each one of us, no matter what our struggles, no matter what our perception of ourself is going into this episode, I pray that we'll come out of it feeling empowered, feeling like we can embrace who we are at every level and know that you are in that and that you can take and use every one of our character, uh, qualities i won't even and 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 even the things we consider flaws and use them for your glory and we just pray you'd help us to do that god that we could be prayer warriors that that don't fight against how you've made us that move into it and and just embrace who we are and always strive for improvement and becoming more like christ but in a way that embraces who we are at the very core and i thank you god that we can do that because of you and because of your son jesus amen Amen. So before we jump in, I want to address um, something that maybe I'm the only one who's going to notice, but maybe other people, if I'm more echoey than normal, I am in a basically completely empty office. So right now my office has an empty bookshelf, a desk with nothing but my microphone and computer, and a couple empty hanging pots. So like all the plants have been taken out, all the books have been taken out. Uh, The reason I did this, Jamie, have you ever heard of the housekeeping trend or philosophy called quieting a room? No. Oh, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea is you take everything that's practical out of the room. Yes. Um, There's a science behind it and there's some woo-woo behind it. So I'll explain the science behind it. The science behind it is like when you move everything out, you can, you know, dust in the corners. Like we had so much dog hair behind the bookshelf. It was disgusting. So, so some of it's for that. You get airflow maybe in places that were kind of stagnant and that can help with even like, you know, mold or, or that kind of thing. And the other kind of practical benefit is then when you put things back in the room, you're doing it a little more deliberately, right? As opposed to just you've accumulated clutter and it stays there because that's where it is. The the woo-woo side of it, which I don't ascribe to 100%, but I ascribe to maybe like 1%. Like my office works pretty hard to support me in what I do. So I'm going to give it like a couple days rest of having to hold all my junk. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, so if you hear the echo, that is what's going on, but that is not what we're chatting about. We are chatting about ADHD. Um, Do you want to even like introduce the topic, how we even got on the subject of, of chatting about this? Okay. So I don't even know what maybe it was Facebook ads. Maybe it was something I saw. I I think it came from seeing some kind of quiz about oh, uh-huh. ADHD. <laughs> and I think it was in children, like signs of ADHD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just happened to look at it and I was like, I think that's like, that's me. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if I Googled ADHD in women or Uh if I just saw things, um, or if I, you know, spoke about it in hushed whispers with friends and big brother picked it up and then (laughs) (laughs) stuff through my newsfeed. I'm not sure, but I ended up finding a, a quiz about ADHD in women, which can manifest very differently than ADHD in young children or young boys, Mm -hmm. especially. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it, it started to bring back memories of things like my teacher in seventh grade, 
um, shocking me because I'd always been a decent student and teachers loved me and I was always very compliant and willing to, mm-hmm. but my, my seventh grade English teacher, Ms. Doyle, um, said one of the comments, I got a C, I think. And for me, I was uh-huh. like, a C, ugh. Right. And it was a progress report and it was a C and it said, Jamie, um, has trouble paying attention in class. And if you think about the transition from elementary to middle school, there is a big learning curve and difference Mm -hmm. and it's more Mm -hmm. lecture format and less interactive. And I did, and I started remembering that as a child, as a young adult, even, and even as a woman, I would have these times of kind of feeling like I was on the outside because I didn't have all the information or I hadn't been paying attention Mm -hmm. to the instructions and then it gets time to do the thing and I'm watching the person in front of me to make sure I do it right. And just things like that where I know that I get distracted. Um, I know that my train of thought and you guys probably notice on this podcast (laughs) or when I'm interviewing other people that I can get off on tangents really easily or forget what the original question even was. So Mm -hmm. just things like that kind of made me think. So I came across, um, I've, I heard several podcasts about this and one of them that I listened to recommended this one particular book. Um, there are tons of them, but the one that I ended up reading was called a radical guide for women with ADHD, embrace neurodiversity, live boldly and break through barriers. And it's by Sari Solden, Michelle Frank and Ellen Littleman. Um, this book, I just thought out of curiosity, let me read this book as a person that doesn't know if I have ADHD or not, but Mm -hmm. maybe it will have insights into how I can manage what is definitely for me, I would say, even if it's not diagnosable ADHD, neurodiversity, Mm -hmm. like I think differently Mm -hmm. than some people, I function differently. How can I gain and glean some truths from this? But of course, reading the book, um, I am definitely susceptible (laughs) to suggestion. But after reading the book, I came away just like, this is so me, like everything. Uh everything was so me that I probably have it. So I haven't been to a doctor, haven't talked about medication, probably going to mention it at some point and just, you know, see if there's something that can be done. But this conversation came out of my reading of that book. And Alana, you also read that book or at least read part of it Mm -hmm. um, so that we could address this idea of how does being neurodivergent in terms of like maybe being on the ADHD spectrum, if there is one, Um, Mm -hmm. for women, how does that impact your prayer life and what can we learn from it? How can we embrace it? How can we use it as a springboard to develop things in our own prayer lives that will help us to be better prayers and, and to love ourselves better? Yeah. And what's interesting, I remember it was maybe somewhere in the last six to 12 months you had mentioned, like, I think I might have ADHD. And my initial reaction was like, well, that's silly because, I'm still picturing ADHD as the little boy who can't sit at a desk, you know, without wiggling his leg (laughs) or something like that. And I'm just going to come on out with my confession of the day. If I pictured ADHD in women, I would picture somebody who, who acted very, for lack of a better word, like just kind of ditzy. And I don't see that as you, right? I see you like you're intellectual, you're, so I'm like, no, you don't have ADHD. And then I was listening just randomly another podcast where one of the hosts, two women, and one of them like late thirties was diagnosed with ADHD and was talking about the symptoms. And I was like, oh, okay. Actually that Okay. Oh, oh. And then I picked up the book um, in a similar way. So I used to babysit for this little boy who got diagnosed with autism and his mom gave me a book about caring for kids with autism. And when he first got diagnosed, I was like, no, he's not autistic. And then I read the book. I'm like, oh, okay. This explains him. So I was This explains everything. (laughs) This is Jamie. (laughs) So First off, um, I want to apologize to to you and to every woman who struggles with this for having that association with it being like a ditzy kind of thing, because it's not. Um, And I am so glad that you're willing to talk about it because it's not something that I know anything about in terms of, or at least, you know, 12 months ago, knew nothing about what ADHD looks like in women. So could you go ahead and like 
<laughs> Give us the quiz. How, how are, what are some of the telltale signs that you might be an adult woman with ADHD? Okay. So some of the things, um, uh, let's see, low self-esteem in areas that you feel like a woman should be proficient in, mm -hmm. but you're not. So like for organizing. instance, <laughs> organizing, keeping house, uh, maintaining schedules, being on yeah. time, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, over apologizing, being extremely oh my apologetic. Gosh, that's so you. <laughs> yeah. And I, for years I was just like, why am I, I remember, um, and someone that I worked with was like, were you like, abused as a child oh, no. and kind of jokingly which isn't yeah. funny for anyone out there right. who's suffered abuse yes. of course but i said no in fact my parents were incredibly supportive and loving and built me up to the point where i was sometimes uncomfortable with their mm -hmm. esteem of me you know um mm -hmm. i mean that again maybe that's part of it but you know maybe i felt like i had to overcompensate by not i don't know mm -hmm. but i think the possibility of adhd that that apologizing dis, despite there not really being a yeah. reason. Um, I remember fervent prayer when I was planning my wedding because I realized that I don't know how to organize anything. God mm -hmm. help me. And I literally, this was a huge prayer request and I got a binder and tried so hard to keep stuff organized. And God mm -hmm. gave me, I mean, it was a huge Ebenezer to God's faithfulness that mm -hmm. I was able to keep stuff organized because it was a struggle yeah. and God gave me what I needed to help do that. But I remember that. Um, so trouble organizing things, um, trying really hard and just grinding constantly until burnout. Yeah. Um, and then having shame when you burn out and still don't have the results you necessarily wanted. Um, mm -hmm. maybe, that yeah, was go ahead. That was something in the book that really stood out to me is like, if I go into 12 months ago, me, if someone said, well, what would ADHD in a woman look like? I would be thinking about like the things that she has a hard time doing, like maybe, you know, being punctual or right. something. I would have never thought about the shame and the negative self-talk. That's another one that, um, yes. you know, and as soon as That's I heard that- one. As a symptom of women with ADHD, I'm like, oh, hi, Jamie. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Yep. And so I think what's interesting for me watching this is there are a few direct symptoms, and that maybe constitutes 2% of what might be frustrating about having ADHD. Right. And then there's 98%, like the shame and the the fact that you're, you know, like maybe you're <laughs> kind of like a, a kid who's left-handed, like there are no scissors designed for me, right? Like, and right. The, so 98% of even the symptoms are almost indirect is what I see. Like, I don't see it as if ADHD is, um, you know, and, and again, neither of us are doctors or anything, but if it's an inability or it, it's harder for you to focus on something or pay attention to a thing like that, that shouldn't necessarily lead to negative self-talk, right? But because you're not living up to what you picture as the standards of what a responsible adult woman should look like in your mind, you know, I think that's where where it comes from. So in my opinion, ADHD doesn't give you negative self-talk, but being a woman who lives with ADHD in a world that um, prioritizes, you know, being organized and stuff like that, that's what leads to so many of these other symptoms or, or difficulties. It is. And I think it's very similar to being in a marriage where they tell you when you get married, okay, you know, 90% of marital problems come from uh, not, not having your expectations met. So mm -hmm. when you're a person with ADHD and you think you have an expectation that you should be able to do a certain thing in a certain way, mm -hmm. like other people, um, mm -hmm. that failed met expectation is, is the problem. It's not right. necessarily who you are. It's mm -hmm. that you're expecting yourself to be someone different or to do things in a different way. Um, a, just a couple of other just real quick things that I related to that are also symptoms. 
overscheduling feels safer than having downtime. Interesting. Um, and I find that I have always gravitated toward overscheduling, and I think it's because it feels safer than having a big chunk of time on my hands for myself to manage. And that might not be unique to someone with ADHD, but that's mm -hmm. one thing that they mentioned. Um, and then mm -hmm. problems, this is huge for me, problems getting started with a task and then problems knowing when to stop once you get in the yeah. like the flow state. You cannot pull yourself away. And this is me. This is a big part of my lack of punctuality, my not, you know, not working well with schedules that end at, you know, 15 minute increments because mm -hmm. I have a very hard time getting started and my momentum gets going. And I'm like, I got to take advantage of this or I'm never going to get it done. And so then I have a hard time transitioning. Um, and yeah. And I, yeah, that, that's, those are, are several others that I kind of related to, um, that, that are symptoms. Yeah. Well, let's talk a tiny bit about just how this impacts day to day. And then I think it'd be really interesting to talk about how this can play out in our prayer lives. And I would say a good takeaway for any woman, whether or not you have ADHD, think you might be self-diagnosed or, you know, you kind of know that you don't. One, I think it this conversation can help any of us be more gracious. Like if you're if you're somebody who is organized and is punctual, you might look at a coworker who just isn't and kind of wonder like, why can't you be responsible? Like why, what's so hard about this? And hopefully this conversation <laughs> will show it's, it's not necessarily a moral failing, right? It is not a moral failing. It's just the way, like, just the fact that I get winter depression is not a moral failing. It's the way my brain's made, you know? And so it can help. Um, so even if you don't have difficulties with organization, with staying mentally focused, but I mean, who, who doesn't have problems getting distracted mentally when they pray too, right? <laughs> so I think it, I think this conversation will be applicable to all of us. And I think another huge takeaway that I got from the book, like I read it thinking I was reading it like for you, but I was getting encouraged and blessed because of this idea of not feeling so much shame about the way you're made, right? So I think about this with procrastination. Procrastination is 1% of the problem. The shame and embarrassment that you feel about being a person who procrastinated is 99% of the problem, right? And I think that applies to just about any area of our lives, right? The fact that you fall into sin is not the biggest issue that keeps you from God. It's in general, it's the the shame. It's the, oh, I can't go back to God. I heard a really good, I was listening to a podcast about like new year habits and there's, I forget the phrase he used, but the idea is like never fail twice in a row. So it's like, let's say that you're going to, um, give up, give up coffee. Um, and one day you have coffee and then the next day you're like, oh, well, I already drank coffee. Like I already broke my resolution. So I'm just going to keep going. Like never, never lapse twice in a row. Right. And, and that kind of breaks that cycle of the shame being way bigger than the actual problem itself. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So I would love to hear, because I know even on the podcast and definitely just between you and me, you've talked some about like home organization and that that is a struggle and neither of us, I don't think, I mean, I'll, I'll at least speak for myself. I don't, I don't feel like a, a house needs to be like museum worthy every single second of the day. And I wouldn't want to live like that, but I know it has been a struggle. So can you tell us just a little bit about, um, how you've struggled in that area and, and maybe how thinking about that struggle through the lens of ADHD has, ha has changed or helped, or maybe it hasn't just talk to us about that. Yeah. I mean, I would say before kids, it wasn't as much of an issue just because it was just my husband and me, you know, we, mm -hmm. uh, but 
I, I go back though to college when, when my husband, when Matt and I moved into our own home, I think the nesting, I had time after work that mm -hmm. we didn't have other stuff going on. And I, I, I definitely feel like it wasn't as much of an issue then, but I go, I've rewind to having roommates. And one thing that really sticks in my head is one of my roommates called me a slob mm -hmm. lovingly because she mm -hmm. was just that kind of person. It was like not meant in anger, but mm -hmm. she was just like, Oh my gosh, you were such a slob look at your room. And I was very capable of organizing my space, but I didn't see the mess. I mm -hmm. didn't see the incremental mess. I only saw the either totally clean or, oh my gosh, I can't write this paper because my room is a disaster. Thankfully it was small. And so it mm -hmm. didn't take that much time to like tidy it up. Um, but I just didn't see the mess and I did, I wasn't aware. And as I got older, as I got more mature, as I became more, you know, living with another person, you know, when we mm -hmm. got married, I, I got a little bit of that under control of like, oh, okay, I need to see this mess. I need to assess this and pick this up and hang this up and whatever. Um, but my husband, I, he doesn't have ADHD, but he's also not the cleanest person on the planet. I think she actually called him a slob as well in college. <laughs> when we got married, she's like, you uh -huh. guys are, I think she actually said when we got, when we were getting married, your kids are doomed because you're oh, both slobs. No. Like oh, seriously. No. <laughs> and it, again, it was like joking and it wasn't like, uh -huh. she wasn't passive aggressive at all. She's very okay. just, <laughs> like you, you have to know her. It was taken, right, right. but it's one of those things that's always stuck with me and Unfortunately, our kids do have <laughs> issues in that area. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. So anyway, all, but all of that to say, I, I did have issues before. I kind of got it under control when I had manageable stuff. But once mm -hmm. we started having kids and there were toys and there were yeah. other things to do and there's work plus kids plus activities, that is when it became more difficult. Um, so I actually interviewed um, Dana, what's her last name? You can go back. It was A, a Slob Comes Clean is her podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we did an episode with her. You can just, you can, uh, I don't think I did uh, A Slob Comes Clean as the title, but just look for Dana. Um, she is a podcaster that talks about basically her journey of, finding systems that work for her home. Mm -hmm. um, and the way she describes herself, she never mentions ADHD, but I, I think she probably, she has a lot of the same qualities that I do. She expresses mm -hmm. it as more of an artistic brain and project-based mm -hmm. brain as opposed yeah. to just being more linear thinking. So if you don't think you have ADHD, but maybe you are a more artistic person that thinks more mm -hmm. outside of lines, you might have some of these same struggles we're talking about. Um, but in listening to her podcast, she kind of brought into focus that like there are uh, that when you bring stuff into your home and don't keep it pared down, there's a certain kind mm -hmm. of person that cannot handle a lot of stuff in their house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone with ADHD or artistic brain or, or many different types mm -hmm. of people probably that's one of the biggest issues. So what I have come to find is after about five years in a home without extreme decluttering, I get to the place where I can't handle it and I get uh -huh. like way out of hand. So I've had to, in the last few years, after being in our home for 11 years, really do some serious decluttering and I still struggle. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that my... I go through phases. I have not mastered this now that I feel like I at least identify as someone who might have ADHD. Let's say that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it hasn't solved my problems, but it has helped me look for ways that I can make things easier on myself. And it really did. What it did was it, it flipped the script on the way my self-talk works so yeah. that my, my inner critic is no longer saying you're not a good enough woman because you don't keep your mm -hmm. house or right. who are you to talk to people about prayer and spirituality when you can't even make your bed and pick mm -hmm. up your clothes. Like those are the mm -hmm. things that used to go through my head. Yeah. Now that I've started to look at things more of this is how I'm wired and I have to, not that I'm going to continue to live with 
clutter or clothes on the floor mm-hmm, because that doesn't mm-hmm. serve my mental health well either because it right. clutters my brain. But I'm going to have to find other ways to manage this. And it's not, like you said, it's not a moral flaw. It's mm-hmm. not a spiritual lacking. I'm not just, yep. I'm not, not a spiritual person because I can't keep my house clean as well as others. Yeah. Um, but You're I just, a left-handed kid trying to use the right-handed scissors. Yeah. So I would say there are two things is the short answer that have helped me in this whole journey of Mm -hmm. house. Number one, clearing out a lot of my stuff, which Mm -hmm. is definitely important. But number two, looking at myself with more love and more acceptance and more grace and Mm -hmm. thinking instead of shame on you, thinking, okay, what can we do to compensate for the way your brain is wired. How can we make right. this more, exactly. make you more likely to succeed? So. Yeah. Like I, I like to picture it as, let's say you're wheelchair bound and you need to go through your home and you need to go through your schedule and you need to say, how can I make adjustments so that I can function in this home. And I feel like that's, you know, that's, I, I definitely see parallels with like my brain and how, like I have very fluctuating energy. And so I just, instead of being like, well, why can't you like wake up and do today exactly what you did yesterday? And you know, why can't you, why, why are you such a bad woman (laughs) that you can't do this? I just get Sundays. I have great days and I get like 300% productivity. And some days I have bad days and get negative 3% productivity. And so instead of berating myself for that, I just kind of set up my life and my schedule in as much as I can to allow for those fluctuations. And I feel like that's kind of what you're, you're talking about too, in a way it's, it's not, um, Basically, it's okay if, you know, if if you need left hand scissors to keep up a clean home or to be organized to take care of your mental health or things like that, what are some of the things that you can do? And I think this is a really good reminder that advice we get from like self-help people or personal development people or housekeeping people or exercise people. They're giving advice that works for them. And maybe it works for 80% of of the people they're talking to. It doesn't mean that it's always going to work for you, right? So um, I like to think about it like exercise. There are so many different ways to be physically active. And so like if I were to try to do like something, some kind of super, super intense like CrossFit thing, I would like that's, I know that's not, for me. That doesn't mean that people who do CrossFit are bad or wrong. And it doesn't mean that I'm a moral failure because I don't do CrossFit. It's okay. I want to be physically active. I know I'm not doing CrossFit. So let me find something that does work for me. Yeah. And I love the parallel that you're bringing in of just how you are dealing with a completely different issue, Mm -hmm. but it's the same root solution, which is... yeah we don't all fit into a box. Like we are all Mm -hmm. different. And it's what we talk about with prayer. When we talk about pray like you and nobody else, Mm -hmm. Um, like it is important to just embrace the fact that, that we're not all created the same. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I talked about uh, it's Dana White is her name from a slob comes clean. One of the things she talks about is that a lot of like, housekeeping solutions are for people who have a certain kind of wiring and brain. Yep. And, mm-hmm. and so what she discovered in her journey, like I could relate to so much of it because it was, I've had to learn to do housekeeping differently. Yeah. I've also had to learn to have different expectations for myself. And for me, mm-hmm. the most important thing is resilience because I still, I've talked about this before, probably on the podcast. I still remember this time being at my stepmom's house and my dad's house and my stepmom broke something. Like she was getting Mm -hmm. something down from up high and something fell on the floor and broke. Mm -hmm. And I was taken, it took my breath away to watch her. Like I just, it, I, I was shocked because she didn't get mad at herself. Like she (laughs) She just cleaned it up. (laughs) I was like, 
huh. And, and I was like, A, wow, this is crazy. And two, you are so messed up that this oh. is surprising to you, you know? Talking to yourself. My negative self-talk. I'm so oh. messed up that like, this is not normal for me for, to yeah. just, and so it just really shined a light on my self-loathing and my yeah. harshness to myself. So the one thing that has really changed a lot is the resilience of, do I like right at this very moment, I'm in a season where I've been sick twice in a row now in the last month. And it's gotten me like knocked me out for the like few days that I actually had to get stuff done. And just circumstances in life are busy. My house is probably worse than it's ever been. But my heart and my like I'm I am yes I'm bothered by it because I really want my house to be cleaner and I would not want mm -hmm. anyone to set foot in my house but mm -hmm. maybe a year ago I would be like stewing and just right. angry and in a place of like being in a very unhealthy unproductive wallow and I'm mm -hmm. not there like I'm actually That's very cool. honestly I'm just like you know what I'm, I'm going to find a solution to this. I'm working toward that. I'm working mm -hmm. my way out of it oh. and, and it's, it's better. So I'm living the same reality at times. And there are other times mm -hmm. when I'm, I, I got stuff together under control. Things are not as cluttered as they were. So it's mm -hmm. easier. And, and so I do have more time. I think that the house can be under control, but, um, but I can live the same circumstance and still be spiritually at peace. Whereas before right. I was absolutely not. Mm -hmm. No, I, I love that. I uh, heard a really cute comment from somebody on social media about how they're dealing with their negative self-talk and the rule they've given themselves is anytime they criticize themselves, they have to call themselves like a rated G insult. <laughs> so it would be like, it's 10 o'clock and you're still in your pajamas, you silly headed pumpkin, you know, like <laughs> just, just kind Cotton of headed almost nitty like, muggins. exactly like, kind of like your friend calling you a slob, but you knew that it was, you know, or, or you right. walk out of your office, you're like, my bedroom is such a mess. I'm such a, you know, but just like a, a cute, silly, almost term of endearment so that you can yes. remind yourself, like you can be gentle with yourself. Like, you know, it's, it's a kind of language you would use with a kid. And I feel like if, once we learn to talk to ourselves with that gentleness, it, it definitely helps. Well, I don't know if it was you or somebody else that said that another way to, to approach that is when you feel that really evil negative voice creeping in that you should have handy, a picture of yourself as a child mm -hmm. and be like, would yeah. you say this to this child? Seriously? Yeah. Would you? I know, or or a picture of your daughter. Like, would you use Ooh, these words? That's even to, better. Yeah. I mean, Ooh. doesn't that just like stab you in the chest? Like, no, I would never say that to her. No way. Don't, but the sad thing yourself. is, she has picked up on my negative self talk over the years, and she is a little mini mm -hmm. self talker, mm -hmm. and I hate yeah. it. It 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 just oh grieves me. And so yeah. I've tried very hard. So we've both gotten to the point where we give each other pep talks. So Cute. like. If I say something negative, she, which I have gotten better about it, but I, I still do sometimes. And she'll just tell me, she'll be like, mom, you don't, you shouldn't talk about yourself that way. You should love yourself. Aww. Be gentle with yourself. Because I will say these things to her yeah. and I give her the pep talk of, no, yep. you are not that. You don't deserve to speak that way to yourself. Yeah. So I guess there's that I've, I've equipped She's her learning with a negative self-talk and then also with tools to <laughs> take it back. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You, you gave her the disease and the cure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to look, look at it. So you silly headed pumpkin. <laughs> that's right. You, you silly head. Well, let's chat about what this does in your prayer life. So how have you noticed because of the wiring of your brain, how does it impact or did it impact before you became more aware of it, your prayers? It still does. I, I have always kind of berated myself for not being very good at deep, long prayer. Mm -hmm. And there've been times when I've been successful at it and I can, 
and especially when the spirit moves me, I definitely can. Mm -hmm. But I always looked at that as a spiritual flaw. Mm -hmm. Um, I do think there's a time for a long prayer. I do. Yeah. But for me, when I, I, I find that like you talk about needing to kind of ride the wave of energy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to ride the wave of inspiration sometimes and not expect yeah. that every prayer time that I have is going to be that my sticky yeah. note prayers that you have helped me like with my prayer journal and where you, you mm -hmm. had told me about like this sticky note system for maybe having different sticky notes for different people and things and mm -hmm. a visual that I can look at with small things. Um, yeah. and you know, one word prayers, things like that, mm -hmm. walking through my home and praying like those things I've embraced those as being my go-tos because that mm -hmm. is what, when I'm in a normal state of not inspired to deep prayer. Right. I, those are things that I can do and do well. And I need, and I've started to just be like, you're good at those things. And that is mm -hmm. a gift. And yeah. So I, I have done less shaming and more, okay, yes, this part of deep prayer is so important, but I need to make sure that I embrace the inspiration when it comes and yes. fully dive deep into it and roll with it. But mm -hmm. don't berate yourself when it doesn't come or when you try to conjure it up and it's just not happening. It's okay. Yeah. And God says it's okay, you know? Yeah. Um, I love then, that. Yeah. And then I feel like another thing that I've learned to embrace is God loves my tangents. And Aww. I've learned to yeah. just have a conversation in the car with God and mm -hmm. flit from thing to thing. And he yeah. loves it all. I just give it all to him. And so... God isn't afraid of my tangents because he's all there in all of it. And he yeah. even reads between the lines of what yeah. I've skipped over and what right. I get distracted from. And he takes those down to their logical conclusion. He knows the heart of what I'm saying. And so that's pretty freeing that he it made is. me this way and he loves talking to me. That's how I like to look at it. Yeah. I heard an author talk about, she called it her hummingbird brain, like Ooh, flitting yes. from thing to thing. Yes. And it's not like you'd look at a hummingbird and be like, can't you just pick a flower and stay there? What's wrong with you? Like that is how they're designed. <laughs> yeah. You know, and others like, I don't know a ton about woodpeckers, but I picture them like pecking at the same spot for a really long time. And that's how they're designed. Ooh, that's and so the, good. That's a whole know? episode of how our prayer lives are like birds. Are you a hummingbird or a woodpecker, right? Like, Ooh, so let's do another quiz. <laughs> that's like the hummingbird's not going to look at the woodpecker and be like, how can you stay in that same spot? Like you have been praying the exact same thing all afternoon because that's how it was made and the woodpecker shouldn't look at the hummingbird and be like oh why can't you pick a flower and stick with it because that's how that's how the hummingbirds are made and I think one of the things that has allowed me to really increase my just grace and compassion for others is to recognize even personality types that rub me the wrong way that there is something beautiful in the variety that we have. And so I would hate to live in a world that was made up of people just like me. And I don't think it would function very well at all, <laughs> you know? And I think we can do that in our prayer lives and we can extend that same grace to ourselves. Right. And, and I love what you're doing is you're just setting up practical. You're not trying to change your disposition. You're not berating yourself for having a hummingbird brain. You're saying, as a person with a hummingbird brain, what are some of the best prayer strategies that I can have set up? And I think that's really smart. Yeah. And I think there is, there is a temptation to label yourself with something and use it as a crutch or an excuse. Uh -huh. And I, I am keenly aware that I don't want to do that though. Like they're, they're the extremes. There's the tendency to shame yourself for not being different and there's the tendency to say, oh, oh, well, I have ADHD, so I'm exempt from cleaning my house or uh -huh. I'm exempt from praying because I just can't do that. That's not how I'm wired. I mean, there's definitely um, room for growth. I mean, we have mm -hmm. immense neuroplasticity. Our brains can do amazing things when we set our mm -hmm. minds to them and when we pray mm -hmm. for God to transform us. Um, so... There is, I just wanted to mention that as I'm always careful in my love for myself and God, how God made me, 
I'm always open to his refining process and to his improvement. And I can strengthen some of the stuff that is difficult. I mean, it doesn't mean just because something is difficult right. for you, you shouldn't take it on or try mm -hmm. to cultivate. Like we've talked about, like you can cultivate concentration by mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. time. Because I yeah. also feel like as our world is becoming increasingly fast paced and digital and instantaneous and everything, that we are all collectively probably exhibiting some ADHD tendencies in our brains mm -hmm. and in our mm -hmm. prayer lives. You know what I mean? Like just easily um, distracted for sure. Easily distracted. If you want to say that that element, that, that's true for so many of us. And mm -hmm. so whether you have a label or not, all of us can strive for better in, in areas in a healthy way though. That's at the yeah. core of it is in a way where you're looking to, um, you know, setting realistic expectations for mm -hmm. what the next step is for you. And it, it's not going to be, I want to be like her and I'm going to exactly. look like her in, in a week of intense mm -hmm. meditation because that may not happen and that's okay. And you that might not look be like what her. God has called you to. And so if you're, right. yeah, if you're trying, you're spinning your wheels, you're a hummingbird trying to peck at a tree, <laughs> like yeah. you're not helping the tree. You're not helping the woodpeckers. You're not helping the flowers. You're not helping the hummingbirds. Like <laughs> you're just yeah. wasting a lot of energy. Yeah. And I just feel like, um, a really key component to, any kind of self-evaluation or setting goals for yourself or, you know, in any situation is going to God and saying, okay, what do you want from me? Like, who mm -hmm. do you want me to be? And I know that's vague. So maybe more specifically in your prayer life, um, God, teach me how you want me to pray right now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or you can say, you know, Lord, teach me what's one thing that I can strive for in my prayer life and, and meditate on that and think about that and be yeah. open to God speaking to you in different ways about that, whether it's through scripture or conversations or sermons or podcasts mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but to, to always remember that God is willing to talk to you, that he's willing to, to guide you and direct you and, and walk with you in this journey of, of self-discovery and self-improvement, however that looks, because when we try mm -hmm to improve ourselves based on just random ideas, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it, it could be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I think that's a perfect way to perfect note to end on. So thank you so much for being open about just your journey. I know one thing that I have seen walk, watching you kind of go through this and coming to terms with, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm an adult woman with ADHD and this is what it looks like. Like to me, you were talking about like, I don't want this to turn into an excuse. For me, it seems the exact opposite. It, to me, it's like, okay, this is why I am how I am. It's not a moral failing. It's how I was wired. I was wired this way by God himself. So there must be some benefits to it. Um, how about this? Let's end on a super positive note. What are some superpowers in the brain of an adult woman with ADHD? What does that make you actually very good at? Oh, wow. That is such a good question. Um, I actually saw, cause I saw someone with a shirt about uh -huh. this with dyslexia. It was a student uh -huh. at, at, um, the middle school I sub at, and she had a shirt that said dyslexia superpowers and listed them, which was cool. And I okay. haven't really thought about this, but I would say one is, and I don't know if this is related to the way my brain works, but mm -hmm. I am really good at taking at, at quickly assimilating a lot of different unrelated things into a mm -hmm. common thread. Interesting. Sense. It really served mm -hmm. me well with science when I was working in laboratory okay. research. I had mm -hmm. so many aha moments in the shower where I would have read like several yeah. different papers. I'm working on a project, uh -huh. designing an experiment. And then I just was like, oh, oh, like this totally seemingly unrelated paper yeah. relates to this thing that I'm working on in this experiment I'm designing. Because you're the that. hummingbird. You're yeah. like, okay, this flower reminded me of that flower. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I felt like cool. science was a great fit for me. Research was a great fit for me because mm -hmm. I could hold on to bits and pieces. Um, I think it also helps me 
creatively maybe just mm -hmm. her, because I do have these times where because it is hard to get going on something right once I get going I think I maybe get to a deeper level than if I was more regimented and scheduled so yeah when I, I have few more few fewer and farther between times that I'm creatively engaged but when I am I feel like it helps me to be more engaged I don't know I can totally see that and it probably helps you to be more discerning about what projects creatively you do take on right because so I have to be somebody, extra careful I yeah know. somebody I with unlimited plate. creative energy they might just yeah this sounds fun and, and you're gonna have to be um kind of picky or like I, I forget how many they say Picasso had like a bajillion, you know, paintings, drawings, doodles, like he was super prolific. And that's the way his brain was wired. And I could see someone like you, like maybe you're going to um, be a, a flitting hummingbird for 350 days a year. And for 15 days a year, you're going to be like pollinating this one flower <laughs> like a queen you know <laughs> so that's yeah. cool well I also I think you're so good at when the schedule changes at the spur of the moment like you're one of the most adaptable people I know oh um, yeah I do have that quality and maybe that mm -hmm. does have to do with my yeah no I, I could see it because you're you're able yeah. to flit you know, yeah. and so when I call you at 930 at night, I'm like, we're in Anchorage and the kids don't have any tennis shoes. <laughs> like, you're like, oh, sure, I'll come over. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've always felt that. I remember when I was going to do a mission trip right out of college and mm -hmm. they gave us a bunch of training. And one of the things they said that you should be is a fat missionary, flexible and teachable. And it mm -hmm. went into this whole thing about like, what are the qualities of someone who's flexible and teachable? Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, I'm good at that. Like that's I already figured that out. <laughs> I am that person. Like I really that's can cool. be. And it probably stems from not having much like administrative qualities <laughs> where I'm mm -hmm. like I I love being told what to do. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've told you that before in our work together. Yeah. Like yeah. I love being told what to do because mm -hmm. I can do that and yeah. I can check that box. But when yeah. I am left kind of in an ocean of time, here's and a project. Go ahead and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. So yeah. yeah, I think that makes me a very good employee for some people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that it it can help me, um, like you said, be be flexible. Yeah. Well, I even think about what you're doing now. You're subbing at your kid's school every so often, and for some people like being in a different classroom on different days of the week and like going to bed on a Thursday and not knowing where you're going to be Friday morning, like people like me, that would be very stressful. Yeah. And no, if I'd you're, that. if you're a hummingbird, you're like, cool, I get to do new things. I'm not going to get bored. And <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, no. Well, this is great. Oh. I feel so good about myself now. Oh, so good. <laughs> Jamie, you are you are one of the fattest people I know. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Oh, well, it was really fun talking about this. And and again, I just I appreciate it because I, I feel like as an adult woman and as a Christian woman and as a homemaker, having ADHD would be a struggle because we do put certain weight on things like, can you run a home? Well, do you keep a tidy house? Are your kids coming to all their things on time? And, and for some people, it's kind of just second nature. Like for you, it's second nature to just wake up and have the school district call you and say, you're in Mrs. Brown's second grade class today. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, like, but other people like that, that's just not how how they're wired. And so I love and appreciate that you are wired the way you're wired. And it's been fun for me to watch you. I feel like you have, um, I can, I can sort of tell that the negative self-talk isn't as huge of this horrific monster as it used to be. It's not. In fact, mm -hmm. looking back, like reflecting back on maybe a year ago, like yeah. I hadn't realized until this conversation, just how much it's receded. So yeah. that's huge. That's a huge gift. It is. It's huge. So praise God and thank you. And we hope that everybody listening got some good encouragement and inspiration. Um, 
how about what is your best prayer tip for somebody with a hummingbird brain? I would say um, I just love prayer on location. Pray through your home and use those triggers to pray mm -hmm. um, or, you know, visualize in your head that you're walking through somewhere. Yeah. Like if you're, if you you're moving you're, somewhere, you're, you're moving. not staying in one yeah. spot. Yeah. Yeah. Pray, pray a story. Don't, don't just pray oh, a list I necessarily for me. Praying a story helps. Yeah. That is perfect. All right. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you, Jamie. And we'll talk to you all next time.